Good morning. Good morning. It's been a while. <laughs> I, I almost Googled how to get from here to there. <laughs> you didn't change the locks on the doors. It is really good to be back. It is good to see you all. And I'm grateful for the time away. I'm grateful for the time in this moment, in this sacred space. <sighs> Would you gather your hearts and your minds in prayer with me? Amen, Aretha, Queen of Soul. On your way home, rest in peace, and may we sing on. Amen. A thin place. That Celtic notion of a place where the veil between heaven and earth is lifted to reveal the two entities are much closer than we had imagined. Heaven and earth, the Celtic saying goes, are only three feet apart, but in thin places, the distance is even shorter. Just a month ago, I recognized that I was in such a place, a place of revelation, a place of rocks and spirit, a place where earth greets the sea, a place where the untamed saltwater air rose up to mingle with the wild, heathered, rolling hills, and upon one hill, just like that, in that place, I was held up by the earth. Up early, Becky and Rowan still asleep in a small highland cottage cabin, really, that we'd rented. I was alone, but I was not alone. The day before, we journeyed long to get to this northernmost tip of the mainland of Scotland, Betty Hill, Mackay Country the landscape of my ancestors on my mother's side. Filled by the depth of this landscape, I stretched out on a rock that was naturally shaped to hold my prostrated self. While lying out, I felt like I was kneeling in adoration. The tears welled in my eyes as I saw the veil lift. The three-foot distance was indeed made shorter. The communion of saints was all around. My ancestors who walked those very hills could have sat on this very rock. The nearby crofts, long abandoned because of the highland clearances, spoke of a tough life. But the oat cakes in my backpack, the same as the breads made long ago, the soils and grains that nourished them, nourished me. The ancient burial cairn up on a hill even further behind me, standing as a sentinel, reminded me not just of my clan roots, but my ancient roots five or six thousand years before, way before Jesus walked similar hills in Palestine, these ancestors found meaning in the landscape, deeply moved, humbled, awed, and connected, I felt. The presence of sacred memories and the blessings lived out in a thin space, God in the land, heaven and earth close. And today's beautiful Gospel of John reading, Jesus is speaking about a thin place, a place of bread and spirit, heaven and earth. And the radical claim is made, Jesus is this thin space. I am the bread that has come down from heaven. Such quixotic speak, no surprise, makes people nervous, uneasy. People who listened to this radical rabbi then and to those of us gathered now listening once again. While perhaps overly familiar to some, these mysterious words should unsettle us. To help drive home a point, we've added a sermon title this morning, Eat God, to ensure we all squirm a bit in our pews. 
Well, I don't think Jesus is trying to mess with us intentionally. I do think he and the early Johannine community are trying to get our attention, trying to provoke all who would listen, to disturb the senses in order to reveal a deeper truth. To recall a little context of this wonderful sixth chapter of John, we recall it begins with Jesus being sought by a very large crowd. They followed him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, that sea where you recently were, Julie, because they had seen the signs that he was doing for the sick. The people sought a healer. And notice Jesus then becomes a provider. From the perceived scarcity of the five barley loaves and two fish generously offered, 5,000 are fed. People's awe for Jesus grows, a healer, now a provider. These are very here and now real needs that he is addressing. They see him as a prophet who has come into the world, and then this strange verse, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him and force him to be king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This healer nourisher had not come to be a ruler in the way that we expect. People are clearly drawn to Jesus, but once again, misunderstand his purpose. And so he enters a synagogue in Capernaum and offers them more. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus is healer. Jesus is provider. Jesus cares about the life of the world. But it gets stranger as Jesus continues. The bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Unsettled faces now become baffled. And stranger, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the human one and drink his blood, you have no life in you. The baffled now become offended and disturbed. A more accurate translation of the Greek here used to eat my flesh is to gnaw on my flesh <laughs> as an animal gnaws on the bone. Disturbing, troubling, alarming, we join the Johannine community and we cringe. When the daughter of Reverend C.L. Franklin started singing secular music, a shift from her gospel roots forged earlier at her father's new Bethel Baptist church in, De church in Detroit, people were disturbed, troubled, alarmed, perhaps some even cringed. But in taking this risky step, the world became empowered. The Queen of Soul emerged as one of the most significant musicians and voices of the 20th century. The divides between sacred music and secular music crumbled. Her sound, is a singular, her sound is singular as her name, as many journalists have been putting this week. Aretha Franklin, who died this past Thursday, defined the very fusion of gospel and R&B known as soul music. One could say the veil dropped as the two became one through Aretha's music. The secular and the sacred are one and the same. Our friend and colleague over at Harvard Memorial's Church, Reverend Jonathan Walton, put it this week, Aretha Franklin shattered the thinly constructed binary between the sacred and secular, which diminished the power of black spiritual expression. Like congregants in New Bethel Baptist on Sunday mornings, her music reconciled spiritual strivings and physical satisfaction. Her unique riffs and unmistakable cries gave voice to the complexity of life and love, heartbreak and physical affection. This soulful expression of her voice captured the ups, the downs, longings, heartbreak, joy, and pains of life. While some at first may have cringed, Aretha powerfully linked these two worlds and brought more respect to this world. Jesus as bread, Jesus as flesh to be eaten, to be gnawed on, these powerful metaphors drive home a similar truth. There is no place where God is not. Seeing the world as secular or sacred, holy or profane, physical or spiritual, misses the profound truth of incarnation. If we return to the very beginning of this Celtic favorite Gospel of John and hear the opening hymn sing out, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. We hear the rhythms of incarnation of God with us. The Celtic Christians love this hymn as it enforced their understanding that God's image is not just in humans, but in all that has life, all of creation, trees and stones, whales and waters, so the invocation to gnaw on the bread of life makes deep sense with such a worldview. Taking in Jesus as food, savoring Jesus as nutrient is the same as taking in life abundantly, living fully. As it says later in John, I have come that you would have life 
abundantly. Eating God becomes eating life, taking into your very essence life itself, embodying the earthy and spirit-filled Jesus bread of life and being nourished to see life as abundance. I will confess, it is far easier to do so when a very generous and loving church gives you three months to explore with your family the very concept of living abundantly while on an extended reflection leave. Let me say again a resounding thank you from the bottom of my heart to the top of our 236-foot steeple for the gift of these past months. This extended leave has been called a Celtic family way, finding abundance in a frenetic wor wor world. Not a frenetic word, a frenetic world. <laughs> and it was indeed a profound gift. A singular gift, once in a lifetime, never to be repeated at this stage in my life, in the stage of my four-and-a-half-year-old son, in the stage of my beloved spouse, Becky. To have this chance to spend our life together, to be unplugged from the world and to plug into the simple day-to-day -day was indeed inspiring and regrounding and re-energizing. To live abundantly inspired by the Celtic Christian tradition was something we attempted to do, and I think we did it well together. This was incredibly grounding for us, and I really look forward over the coming weeks, if not months, of telling some of the stories and the learnings and the ponderings that I and we encountered over these past months. If I were to summarize our time uh, away, which is dangerous to do in one word, I would say presence. God's presence, Earth's presence, our presence. I come back to you far less concerned about belief and a lot more interested in presence, in God being with us, God being with the Earth, the Earth being with us. While belief on some level, I think, can seem internal, it's often taken in from the outside and sometimes used in ways that intentionally or unintentionally can other others. Our work together as people of faith, I think, profoundly is not primarily to share certain beliefs, creeds, or confessions, but to point ourselves and others to the presence that is at the heart of all. To me, this feels like the faithful call of Jesus to eat life. Did we find a Celtic family way? On one level, yes. But on another level, no, we found that such a quest, of course, does not have an end. To continue to search, to continue to be a pilgrim, to pilgrim on, and to seek the abundance that every moment has is indeed a challenge for each of us at every moment. So our sabbatical was not ideal, it was real. There were mosquito bites, there were cuts and scrapes, there were two split lips, and not just one, two from Rowan, one right before getting on a long plane ride to Hawaii, of course. There was an almost broken nose uh, of Becky, thanks to Rowan. There was a handful of poor sleeps. Rowan had some normal four-year-old breakdowns. Becky got sick for two weeks in Scotland. There were long security lines causing fr frantic sprintings to almost missed flights. But there were flights. I mean, come on, there was the wild gift of new places, new landscapes. There were sunset stars, four full moon sightings. There were contemplative services where I had no responsibility in leadership. There were unrushed mornings. There were hikes, swims, bikes, runs with a newly emerging interest in sports rowing. There was no email, no texts, no calls, alleluia. There was a sweet unplugging from a daily onslaught of unsettling political news. As an aside, I just want to say I was really counting on coming back to hear about an impeachment. But alas, there's more work to be done. Our sabbatical was Sabbath-keeping, and it was spiritually grounding. It was not ideal, it was real. It was magically real, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. For it is in the real where the Spirit shows up, is it not? It's the real where incarnation happens. It's the split lips and the sweet ocean dips. It's the fleshness of living. It's the Word made flesh. The Word not made angelic, not made heavenly. The Word made real. God as bread. God as something we can chew on to savor, to rely on. There's an intimacy in this. There's a deep sustenance in this. Our faith becomes a deeply embodied part of us. Becky and Rowan have been away for the past four days in Connecticut visiting Grandpa Dave. 
And this is the longest time in four months that we have been separated, and I have to say it's been quite an adjustment, a shock to the system. Because we have lived in an intimate way, we've been together with one another. An example of what it means, I believe, to hold close the things and the people that are dear to us, to prioritize that which is sacred and meaningful to us. How do we do so when we're not given the radical gift of months off? We do so by prioritizing the things that give us life. We do so by sleeping with bread. It's a wonderful little book that Julie and I were both given during our Duke Divinity Innovation Training that led us in part to our re-engagement as a church with the arts in a more substantive way here at Covenant. This book is called Sleeping with Bread, Holding What Gives You Life, written by the Lynn family. And this strange book title comes from a place and a story in World War II, a very sad story, where there were too many orphans in Europe. And many of them were plagued with PTSD, having known too much loss and too much physical hunger. But in one particular refugee camp, where these children were not able to sleep well night after night, fearful of waking up to more loss and nothing again, no food in front of them, some caretakers had a very creative idea. They allowed the children to fall asleep sleep with small loaves of bread in their arms. The children clung to them as beloved teddy bears. And as a result, they began to sleep right through the night in peace. They no longer worried about waking up hungry. They held close that which gave them life. So what gives you life? What gives you vitality? Who are the people that spark passion and interest and vitality in your life? The bread of life desires that we hold those people and those things close as best we can. Impermanent life is. People are not always with us that we love. Our priorities and desires change. But our call, regardless of where we are in the journey of life, I believe is to spend time praying and thinking and talking about the things that spark our interests, our desires, and trust that by focusing on these things, God's way of abundant life will become clearer to us and in so others. The big things like vocational discernment and relationships and the smaller things like noticing bird songs, enjoying novels. The early, early Johannine community most certainly would have heard the text, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them sacramentally. They would have thought of communion. While a lot of theologians have debated back and forth over the centuries about whether John 6 is primarily about Jesus talking about faith or primarily Jesus talking about the sacrament, I believe both have deep resonance. Today it is nice that we get to celebrate communion. I'm grateful for my first Sunday back with you having the table before us set. <coughs> Today we will hear that this meal is not about sacrifice, it's about substance, about presence. We'll be invited to take in the one who shows a radical love for the life of the world. We'll be reminded that Jesus abides in us, just as John's Gospel uses that Greek word meno, which is translated abide more than any other New Testament writer, God abiding in us, in the world, a central refrain in John's Eucharistic theology, so too we remember that God abides in each and every one of us. In communion and thanksgiving, that defines this meal, we're reminded to live then sacramentally, to take in the life, the vitality, the vigor, the life flow of Jesus into our very bodies, and not just here at the table, but everywhere. Taking this vitality in allows us the courage then to get through the messiness that we will greet in the world and even in our own lives and in our own hearts. We've, of course, faced some of that uncertainty and messiness in our world this week, as Julie has mentioned about Elsa, our dear sister, who has once again been hospitalized, this time her cancer spreading to her brain. Our community is holding Elsa and Rani deeply in these moments. These are difficult new realities for all of us to face, especially for her and for her family. But even in this, I want to share a word of hope. Julie and I had the privilege of being with Elsa and Ronnie in that hospital room, not just with them, but with all four of their children this past week, just about a day after she first heard this new diagnosis. And we were there with laughter and some shed tears together. 
But there was poise. Elsa has poise. Elsa is an example of what it means to be poised in life and to take in the messiness and to smile at it and to live with integrity and especially to live with faith. Her very veins fused with the vitality of God. And she's an inspiration to us, and she inspired us. We gathered, we held hands, and we sang. There's a whole list of hymns you could sing in that moment. We sang, joyful, joyful, we adore you. Verse 4, mortals join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. God's own love is reigning o'er us, joining people hand in hand. Ever singing march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us sunward in the triumph song of life. We were moved. And may that song continue to give Elsa the vitality and wellness she needs to journey on. On August 8th, joyful music led one of the great groundbreaking womanist theologians of our time sunward in the triumph song of life. Reverend Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon, the first African-American woman ordained in the now PCUSA back in 1974, died at the young age of 68. A light has been dimmed in the Presbyterian denomination. In her foundational work, Womanism and the Soul of the Black Community, she writes, there's a form of capitalist Christianity that combines defense of the sanctity of the economic system with racial and theological conformity. Such Christianity separates the spiritual person from the bodily person and calls on people to be spiritual but avoid things like politics and real life. Like Aretha, like Jesus, like Reverend Dr. Cannon, we are called not to believe in a separation of the physical and the spiritual. Separation being against what God means in incarnation. Reverend Cannon prophetically said, do the work your soul must have. Perhaps she would say, eat life. Seek out and do the things that cause your heart to sing. And in so doing, look there for God. Friends, may we be inspired by the saints gone before us, saints from the northernmost tip of Scotland, saints Aretha and Canon, and may we savor Jesus, eat life, and live fully. Amen. <laughs>